Missionary of Mercy, Cubans welcome Pope Francis, who is on a mission in Havana. Pro-life vote, senators debate a bill protecting the lives of babies in the womb who can feel pain. Refugees welcomed, the U.S. will take in thousands more refugees from Syria. And family portrait, we meet the artist behind the Holy Family icon for the world meeting of families. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, September 21st, 2015. Good evening from Washington. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. Pope Francis travels today to Alguin, the second of three stops in Cuba. He celebrated Sunday Mass with thousands in Havana's Revolution Plaza. Susie Pinto reports from Havana tonight. Susie. Pope Francis had a big weekend here in Havana. He said he came to this island nation as a missionary of mercy. And in true Francis style, he is reaching out to believers and non-believers alike. He met with Fidel Castro, Cuba's former leader. The meeting took place in Castro's home with his children and grandchildren. Pope Francis gave Fidel a book by a Catholic priest who was expelled from Cuba after the revolution. Before that historic meeting, Pope Francis followed in the footsteps of his predecessors, John Paul II and Benedict XVI, with a huge outdoor mass. Thousands of Cubans welcome Pope Francis to Revolution Square in Havana. A massive banner of the Divine Mercy was put up for the Mass, a stark contrast to an image of Che Guevara, one of the founders of Cuba's communist and atheist revolution. Pope Francis asked Cubans to serve one another, saying, we don't serve ideas or ideology, we serve people. Gracias, Santo Padre, por haber favorecido el proceso de renovación en las relaciones entre Cuba y Estados Unidos, que tanto beneficiará a nuestro pueblo. Havana's Cardinal Jaime Ortega thanking the Holy Father for helping to normalize U.S.-Cuba relations, which he says will benefit Cubans. After Mass, Cuban President Raul Castro was the first to greet Pope Francis, followed by Argentina President Cristina Fernandez. Pope Francis just finished celebrating Mass in Revolution Square. It's a moment of great joy for Cuban Catholics. Now they're waiting to catch one more glimpse of him as he passes by in the Pope Mobile. Hope is the word we hear most when talking with people in the crowd. Hope for an end to the embargo, which this man calls cruel and unjust. Hope to keep serving Christ, which Cuba needs, according to this woman. And hope to spread the gospel without fear. Brian, the highlight of this trip has been talking to the Cuban people directly. They have been friendly, they have been open, and the message they are taking away from Pope Francis is a message of hope, hope for the church and hope for the future of this nation. Thank you. Susie Pinto in Havana tonight. Cuban security arrested four people who approached Pope Francis as he greeted crowds in Havana Sunday. Three men and a woman ran toward the Pope at the iconic Jose Martin Monument near Revolution Square. Several of the men threw leaflets into the air. We're told they are human rights activists calling for an end to violence against those who oppose the Cuban government. Anna Quintana is a policy analyst for Latin American and Western Hemisphere at the Heritage Foundation. Anna, do you see Pope Francis playing a role similar to that of John Paul II when he returned to his native Poland in the late 70s? Can Francis get the Cuban people to, to rise up? You know, I, I really hope he can, because his, his mass yesterday and the mass today was, was absolutely beautiful. And, and if you see the amount of people who attended, you know, Cuba is not a traditionally, the Cuban people, are, they just, they're not traditionally religious. And I think it's it's a great thing for him to try to bring them back to Christ. And, I, and in doing so, kind of preaching those same human rights values that contradict the, the Cuban government, right, that contradict the Castro regime. Well, we all saw the images of Fidel Castro, which puts the rumors that he's not around anymore, mm -hmm. uh, to sleep. He was with the Pope, uh, Raul, his brother. Are the Castro brothers using this popular Pope, or is he on to their cunning? You know, I, I, I think he's, I think the Holy Father is intelligent enough, and I think he recognizes that he's, that, you know, that he, that they are trying to use him in, in, in a way, but it appears as though the Cuban government is trying to use him against the American government, right? And kind of saying, I don't know if you noticed Cardinal Ortega saying, thank you for, for you know, for negotiating this U.S.-Cuba detente. 
Well, my question is, and my question has always been to the Catholic Church on the island, when is that detente going to happen between the Cuban government and the Cuban people, right? So this is kind of a great moment for the Cuban gov government to kind of use it as leverage against the United States government, but I don't think the Pope's going to let that happen. Anna, what do you think needs to happen for Cubans to be truly free to practice their faith? Simply, simply put, the Cuban government needs to go away, right? There needs to be, the Cuban people need to be allowed to elect their own government. They need to elect a government that represents their values, that is going to promote and protect human rights, not a government that has slaughtered thousands of people simply for being Catholics. We remember Reagan's ambassador to the UN Human Rights Commission, he was in prison for over 20 years simply for being a Catholic. At the end of the day, communism is a godless ideology, and with that government system in place, there will never be religious freedom on the island. We saw communism fall in the Eastern Bloc. I mean, Cuba's a little country. Can't it happen there? I, I definitely think it can happen, but definitely not with the policy that the United States is pursuing. You know, Reagan never threw a lifeline, both economically and politically and morally, to these crumbling communist dictatorships, right? He allowed them to crumble. But what our president is doing is essentially throwing them a lifeline, saying, you know what, enough is enough. We're tired of being antagonistic towards you. We're just going to condone your military dictatorship. A much different approach. Anna Quintana, the Heritage Foundation, thank you. Thanks for having me. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. The Senate debates banning most abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy. That bill passed the House in May. Jason Calvey reports live from the Capitol Rotunda tonight. Jason? Brian, for the first time ever, senators will vote on this issue tomorrow. The bill says that unborn children can certainly feel pain at least by 20 weeks of pregnancy. So today, senators debated this ban. Democratic leader Harry Reid says the Senate is wasting their time. The 20-week bill is just a way for Senator McConnell to pander to the extremists in his party who are once again holding government hostage so they can attack the health of women. This legislation is going nowhere. But a Quinnipiac poll last year showed 60% of people support limiting abortions after 20 weeks. Only seven countries allow elective abortion after 20 weeks including communist dictatorships like China and North Korea. Republican Senator Tom Cotton supports the 20-week abortion ban. I'm mystified as to why we cannot come together and agree to protect babies who feel pain and who can survive outside the womb. This bill would allow some abortions after 20 weeks. For example, it would allow a raped woman to have an abortion if she receives counseling or treatment. The bill would also allow an abortion to save the life of the mother. We expect a procedural vote tomorrow. It needs 60 votes to survive, which is very, very unlikely. But pro-lifers tell us it's still very important to get every member of the Senate on the record on this issue. Brian? Jason Calvi on Capitol Hill. Thank you, Jason. Carly Fiorina gets a big post-debate boost in the Republican race for the White House. A new poll shows her moving from the back of the pack to second behind a weakening Donald Trump. The latest CNN ORC poll released this weekend shows Fiorina gaining ground on the heels of a strong debate performance. Trump still leads, but he's down eight points to 24 percent. Ben Carson fell five points after the debate to third place. That same poll shows Hillary Clinton's lead growing among Democrats. The poll shows Clinton is backed by 42 percent of Democratic primary voters nationally. That compares with 24 percent for Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. Vice President Joe Biden, who has yet to decide if, he, if he's running, is third at 20 percent. Clinton's lead among Democrats is even higher without Biden as an option. The United Nations will raise the Holy See flag on Friday before Pope Francis has addressed the U.S. General or the U.N. General Assembly. The Holy See and the United Nations Secretariat have agreed that the flag will be raised with no ceremony. It will go up at the same time as other flags are raised that day. Now, it's not clear how this might affect a Palestinian effort to have its flag flown when President Mahmoud Abbas speaks at the U.N. Saturday. The Holy See and Palestine are considered non-member observers at the U.N. Pope Francis sends greetings to the people of Philadelphia just days before he arrives there. In a new video, the Holy Father in English invites everyone to come and be with him. I look forward to greeting the pilgrims and the people of Philadelphia when I come for the world meeting for families. 
I will be there because we, you will be there. See you in Philadelphia. The eighth World Meeting of Families begins tomorrow. The Pope visits Washington and New York before traveling to Philadelphia Saturday. Homeland Security reports about 50 law enforcement and public safety agencies will share a communications center in Philadelphia. The facility is designed to coordinate their efforts during the papal visit. The Secret Service says it could take people two to three hours to clear security. Organizers expect a half million people for the Festival of Families on Saturday, more than a million for Sunday's open air mass. About 17,000 pilgrims representing more than 100 countries are now converging on Philadelphia for this global Catholic gathering. Suzanne LaFranchi is there tonight with more. Suzanne? Brian, the theme of this year's meeting is Love is Our Mission, the Family Fully Alive. A symbol of the family is this portrait of the Holy Family. Today, we visited the artist in his studio. Creating sacred art is Nielsen Carlin's vocation. As a kid, he wanted to be a comic book artist. Now he says he draws a different kind of hero. Everything within a church, within a cathedral, within a basilica, has to focus you towards Christ. The Catholic convert got the assignment of a lifetime when the Archdiocese of Philadelphia commissioned him to paint the official portrait for the World Meeting of Families. The four by five foot oil painting shows a toddler Jesus, Mary and Joseph, and Mary's parents, Saints Anne and Joachim, looking on. The Holy Family faced their own trials and tribulations of their time. Uh, we are going to face our own trials and tribulations, and that's how we're going to get through it as a community. Unveiled last September, the original will permanently hang in the Cathedral Basilica of St. Peter and Paul in Philadelphia. The intention of creating is because there's a desire to create, but we hope to elicit a response from someone when they're seeing it, that it's going to touch them to the core. This particular painting has a certain depth to it and a liveliness. The Archdiocese has been using the image throughout the world to promote the unity and sanctity of family. Many times when you see the Holy Family, you see the three of them. This shows another generation. Carlin is going to be here Saturday attending Mass. He says he's hoping to meet the Pope, and he has his cell phone ready because he knows the Pope is open to selfies. Brian? Suzanne LaFranchi in Philadelphia, thank you. Coming up, analysis of the Pope's message to the Cuban people and the island's communist regime. And Latino Catholics anticipate the historic U.S. visit of the first Latin American Pope. Thank you for joining us for our continuing coverage of the apostolic journey of Pope Francis to Cuba. I'm Brian Patrick, good evening. Thousands gather at Olguin's Revolution Plaza for a mass celebrated by Pope Francis. It's interesting to point out the Holy Father originally heard his call to the priesthood on this day, the Feast of St. Matthew the Apostle. Cubans lined the streets using umbrellas for shade as Francis processed to the plaza in the Pope Mobile. He is the first Pope to visit Cuba's third largest city. The Holy Father's next stop is Santiago de Cuba in the island southeast before flying to Washington tomorrow. Dr. Melissa Mascala is philosophy professor at Catholic University of America. How would you characterize the Pope's message to the Cuban people and maybe to the Cuban government as well? I think there were three main points. First, he was, he was more subtle perhaps than prior popes, but nonetheless, he was very clear in the message to serve people, not ideology, that the regime needs to be avoiding serving the ideology at the cost of serving the people, which is what they're already doing. And also it was very clear in his message about the need to give the church the means and the space to fully exercise its ministry there. It was a, a challenge to expand religious freedom in the country. And, and he also gave a strong message about abortion and the way in which that's also a failure to truly serve the person and to prioritize people over, over things. I understand the abortion rate is very high in Cuba. Yes. So he's coming here for the World Meeting of Families. That's followed by the Synod on the Family in Rome. Tomorrow he's meeting with families in Cuba. Why so much emphasis on the family? Well, the family is crucial. The family is the basic cell of society. If you want to reach the poor, help the poor, bring them out of poverty, the best program for that is the family. And the Pope understands that. He's talked about that in the encyclical on the environment, how human ecology meaning support for a strong family, the best situation in which children can thrive and also spouses can thrive, that that's, that's crucial. And so that's why he's so concerned about this. The people of Cuba are probably fairly close in some ways to the people that he knows and 
Argentina, Latin America. He comes to the U.S. Does he switch gears now or does he continue the same themes? I think we're going to see the same themes reappearing. In the, in the U.S., he's going to continue to talk about and challenge us to overcome this materialistic culture, the throwaway culture that prioritizes material well-being over the more important aspects of human happiness and over the service of people in need. I'm sure he'll challenge us on abortion as well as one sign of that throwaway culture where we, where we seek material well-being over persons. I think he'll challenge us on religious freedom and on marriage and, and family as important ways to ensure that people have priority and have the environment in which they can thrive. I hear a lot of challenges in there. Americans love challenges. I think so, yes. All right. Dr. Melissa Muschella, Catholic University of America, thank you. Thank you. Well, throughout his apostolic journey, Pope Francis is mainly speaking in his native language, Spanish. When he arrives in the U.S. tomorrow, he'll be greeted by thousands of Spanish speakers and a growing Latino population here. Mark Irons has more. The first Latin American pope won't feel too out of place in a country where 38% of adult Catholics are Latino. He's going to reaffirm us in, in the faith. At Our Lady, Queen of the Americas Parish in D.C., Father Avelio shepherds a flock that is over 90% Hispanic. Most masses are in Spanish. Parishioner Pablo Lazaro will be in the White House on Wednesday when Francis meets with the president. Lazaro was invited to represent union workers. For me, I go to, to there, it's not only me. Behind me, it's, it's like a, many people like me, especially to Catholics. At Our Lady, Queen of the Americas Church, Sister Monica Garcia sings the Pope's praises. Well, we are really excited. It's a blessing not only for Catholics, but it's a blessing for all the city. Outside the church, parishioners can read all about the Pope's upcoming visit in Spanish. And when Francis arrives, they'll be able to listen in Spanish. He is giving us, in a way, a, a right to speak Spanish when others are telling us to use English only. He's saying, it is okay. It is okay to speak Spanish. And when Pope Francis says Mass in Spanish at Catholic University, he'll celebrate the first canonization of a saint on U.S. soil. That saint is Spanish missionary Junipero Serra. That is telling you the presence of the Hispanic Catholics has been here since the beginning of the United States. Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. Up next, the flood of refugees into Europe overflows into the United States. And a talented young Catholic singer-songwriter shares her talents with Pope Francis. On Monday, September 21st, thanks for joining us as we follow Pope Francis in Cuba and his trip to the United States beginning tomorrow with the EWTN News Nightly team. I'm Brian Patrick. Pope Francis says the world is thirsting for peace. He cites the wave of migration of those feeling wars and escaping from death in search of life. During his flight to Havana, he told reporters he met one of the Syrian refugee families being hosted by the Vatican as he was leaving. You could see the pain in their faces, he says. Pope Francis urges journalists to do their part by building many little bridges that will eventually become a great bridge of peace. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says the United States is ready to welcome more refugees. The U.S. refugee cap now stands at 70,000. Kerry says that number will grow to 85,000 next fiscal year and 100,000 the following year. Many of those additional refugees would be from Syria, Global leaders are being urged to do more to help hundreds of thousands of migrants crossing into Europe this year. Juliana Tamarazzi is founder of the Iraqi Christian Relief Council, a fellow at the Philos Project. Describe the conditions that you've seen in the refugee camps in Jordan. They're terrible. My Assyrian nation has been reduced to begging. Um, they are sick. There are so many that are cancer-stricken. Uh, they don't have the money for rent. In fact, the talk on the, on, in, on the street is that there are Saudi Muslims that are coming to Jordan trying to convert these people as they've been displaced. Uh, there's so much work that needs to be done from bringing their dignity, dignity back. And really, if they want to leave Jordan, and many of them do, uh, the UNHCR and different world powers have to give them the opportunity to leave and migrate to the West. Or if they want to return to their homes, it is very important for people to know that the Christians of Iraq are the Assyrian 
children of Nineveh. And the world needs to really start thinking post-ISIS. These people want to go, that want to return. How do we return them? How do we restore them and how do we bring them back to their homeland? Tell us briefly about a vigil that's planned in Washington ahead of the Pope's arrival and what you would like the Holy Father to do or say. First of all, we are welcoming him to the United States of America and we're ecstatic that he is so um, for a uh, forthcoming on this issue. He's talked about it repeatedly. He called it a genocide in Bolivia. And we really hope that he will call it a genocide in Congress because let's face it, when Congress, something comes out of Congress, it's amplified throughout the world. We want him to use his immense leadership to mobilize the Vatican, to make this a, a prominent issue and use his diplomacy to bring world powers together to really defeat this Islamic ideology that is killing not only the Assyrian Christians, but also Yazidis and Turkmens. And I believe personally that by engaging the clerics, the Islamic clerics, bringing them to the table Table, we can make a difference. And people listen to him, especially the leaders of other religions. So we'll Indeed. pray for that for you and your people. Juliana Tamarazzi, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Pope Francis will be entertained in Philadelphia this weekend by comedian Jim Gaffigan and a slew of musicians. Some are famous stars, and then there's Marie Miller. We first met Marie a year ago, singer songwriter, one of 10 children from a devout Virginia Catholic family. Her songs have climbed the Christian and pop music charts. Now, Catherine Zeltner reports on her gig of a lifetime. Brian, the Festival of Families is a multicultural, multi-faith celebration during the World Meeting of Families. Big names will perform. Andrea Bocelli, Juanez, and now Marie Miller. We caught up with Marie during a recent rehearsal. It's a small audience now, but Marie Miller's next concert will be heard by millions around the world. It's definitely a miracle. When a producer for the Festival of Families heard her singing on the radio, Marie's phone started ringing. Well, you don't get these kind of calls every day, right? And I'm like, what do you mean, you know? And, and so he said, we want you to perform you know, on stage with our Holy Father. You're not alone. Before that call, Marie wasn't sure she should keep up the musician lifestyle. I asked him, Lord, you know, I need a little bit of affirmation from you. Like, what, what, you know, tell me if you want me to keep doing this and if this is the right thing. The 26-year-old believes the invitation is a sign to play on. Others who will perform that night are music legends, including Aretha Franklin and Sister Sledge. Yeah, I'm just trying to stay focused on that same and be humble too because we're definitely, um, you know, the rookies <laughs> that are performing. Marie is focused and ready. She'll play three songs, including I'll Fly Away, which she calls part of the ABCs of gospel music. I wanted to show Pope Francis uh, Virginia music, you know, being from Virginia and growing up playing bluegrass. I was thinking, you know, he probably doesn't hear bluegrass music that much. So we're going to represent. Marie says her goal Saturday is the same she has for every show, to inspire and uplift the crowd. And what does she hope comes from the papal performance? Simply a smile from Pope Francis himself. Brian. I bet she gets it. Thank you, Catherine. Until tomorrow, for the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. We are back tomorrow evening after EWTN's live coverage of the Pope's arrival here in Washington. Tonight, we, re we leave you revisiting Havana, Cuba, where Pope Francis spent the weekend. Good night. God bless you. <laughs>